about it, we would have, uh, yeah, take forever. So, uh, hopefully you can see as people get up and talk about it, they have a certain theme uh, that they're going to cover. Uh, Andy's was about imagers, and as we're going to see, Paul is more related to uh, sounders, using sounders to derive cloud properties. So with that, again, I don't think any of these people need introductions. I'll just turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Steve. Um, Andy did a nice job of talking about the uh, imager. And one of the things he didn't mention is that we've had imagers for a very long period of time. And that's important if you're going to try to make inferences about climate because you need a long track record. And with the ABH arm, as well as with the sound of hers, they have a track record that's going to probably exceed ours have been around way too long, and hers have been around way too long. Also, I don't think they imagined those instruments would be still flying and being used 40 years later. There have been 16 hers instruments. I'll show you that shortly. And I think the same number of the ours. So we have a lot of instrument to instrument characterization that we have to do. And uh, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing with a lot of other people. We've been reprocessing these 30 plus years of HERS data. And Rich Fry, Eric Olson have been doing a lot of the reprocessing. Nick Beers staged the data for them. We recalibrated using the Tobin technique, Chen Yang Kao, and then Roy Chen did that work in Washington. Andy is giving us his cloud mass so we can merge imager and sounder data somewhat. A master student would come collect in some of the stratospheric clouds, but we're not sure they're all stratospheric, so we call them upper tropospheric, lower stratospheric. And of course, Don Wiley started this work with me, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago. So we have 30 plus years of hers, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to show you Don's results, and uh, where Don and I sort of fell off the edge. And also, when we went to the hers 3 sensor, and we realized we need some recalibration. I'll show you some of the recalibration results. I wish they were better. I'll show you some of the results from just looking at uh, the upper tropospheric clouds. They're quite interesting, and they're probably as interesting as anything I'm going to show you. So anyway, here they are. Here's, I think, uh, 13 of the 16 hers. You'll notice that some of them live longer than others. The ones that live very long are interesting. There's orbit drift. You'll see that again later on. And uh, the three guys that are missing here are NOAA 19 and then MEDOP A and MEDOP B. So the good news is that we have 40 years of them. The better news, in a way, is that we're not going to launch any more birds. The last one we got launched a year ago. So we're working forward from this. The reason hers is interesting to us is it actually has spectral bands that are sensitive to the atmosphere. Only recently do the imagers have a few bands that are sensitive to water vapor and CO2. But if you want 40 years of sensitive to the atmosphere, you have to go to HERS, one instrument. Uh, more recently, we have the sounders, the high spectrum resolution sounders. Um, these channels right here, the CO2 absorption band, are the ones that we really get excited about because they can help us look at high thin clouds. The only trouble is, we really need to know what these spectral response functions are, and they're sort of put together. It's a difficult task, but they're put together by calculation of the measurements before we launch. They rarely spot on. With a cloud, you have to worry about whether you're seeing all the cloud in your field of view, sometimes the cloud edge. You also have to worry about whether there's radiation coming from below the cloud. It's semi-transparent. So it's really something where you need at least two observations to get the cloud mounted get the cloud top pressure. So with the CO2 slicing, you have sensitivity to the different layers in the atmosphere, and you can wipe out the cloud mount, and you can sort of solve for the cloud top pressure. This is something Bill Smith suggested years ago, and uh, that uh, was something that we went forward with in, in the CO2 slicing. But I'll come back to this slide, but I'll just show you an old slide Don and I ginned up. This is goes west and east looking at Cirrus. Depending on the angle and the visible, you'll see it or you don't. If you only use the infrared window, you're going to totally miss where that cirrus is. You're going to put it very low in the atmosphere. And that 
that's one equation with two unknowns, or one observation for two unknowns. And here with the CO2 slicing, you get enough measurements to solve the both the top fraction and the cloud top pressure, and you're correcting for the radiation coming from below the cloud. So you're putting this in the upper atmosphere if you'd like to. So you look at this equation again. What's wrong with this technique? One is you need a cloud signal. You need to know what clear versus cloudy is. The only way you can know what clear is is if you guess. You try to remove the cloud. So you have to do that with a calculation. So you do the calculation, you have a radiance bias between measures and calculator. That's always going to be with you. The other problem you have is when the cloud forcing isn't very good, which it isn't for low clouds or clouds over the polar regions, you really can't do very much with this because you're dividing by a very small number. They're back in grade school, I said that's not a good thing to do. So uh, this has limitations. It's really strongest for high thin clouds. And uh, at least uh, for thinness, we can get down to optical depths of less than one ten. About fractions of less than one ten. Optical depths of one eight to two twenty minutes. Point five. We're good at point five. Have to look at that again. All right, so one of the things that we have then is we have hers in the morning, we have it in the afternoon, so you can sort of do diurnal studies. We have these equator crossings that you can see that these orbits weren't very well, well maintained. We have orbit drift. It just uh, changes when your morning satellite becomes an afternoon satellite. And if you have a diurnal signal clouds, and you're trying to do a 30-year cloud climatology, the time of day is going to be some of these sensors changed. HERS-2 went to HERS-2I. Spectral channels changed. HERS-3 came in there. HERS-4, they changed the field of view size. So these aren't identical instruments, but they're close enough. We're going to try to accommodate differences. And most importantly, try to figure out the spectral responses. So Don and I did this work a long time ago. We found a lot of high clouds. We found more high clouds than other sensors. And uh, that was exciting. More than one third of our observations were high clouds, and about three fourths of them were found clouds. And we published this, and we tried to do trends. In fact, as we had something like 20 plus years, and we did the deviation with respect to the previous decades mean, and we saw that the high clouds seemed to have some sort of an increase, maybe two percent increase in high clouds over a decade. So these were the kinds of things we're publishing. And we looked at HERS-3 now was the new sensor, NOAA 15. And these are the trends of all clouds, pretty constant for the whole time. Not too bad sensor to sensor. High clouds, saw that trend. All of a sudden, NOAA 15 is totally out of family. So that stopped us for a while. And we then saw what Dave Tobin did with the uh, MODIS and uh, AIRS recalibration. It was suggested maybe we could use EASI to recalibrate one of the more recent HERS, and we could bootstrap backwards and get all these sensor to sensor differences based on spectral response sorted out. So that's what uh, has been happening in Washington. It's important, for instance, to know what, especially when you're in the Q branch here, if you're going to be a green spectral response or a red spectral response. That's going to make a big difference. And if you're calculating for something and you find out that you're, uh, too, you have a warm bias in your calculation, you're going to see more clouds that are actually there. Or if you have a cold bias, you're going to see fewer clouds. So you really need to know this. So Medop, Iazi, and HERS are on the same platform. So you can compare. Given the spectral response function for HERS, you can compare it over time and over temperature with respect to EASI, where EASI is involved. This would be for the channel 4, channel 5, channel 6, channel 7, channel 8. I use the CO2 channels 4 through 7. So these guys are a big deal for me. So you can see there's a fair amount of uncertainty in the spectral response function of HERS versus EASI. If you shift it a little bit, you can really narrow this stuff down. And that shift in spectral response function is the one we believe. Then if you look at that same shift that is a function of temperature, not time, it also improves. You don't have a temperature bias. You don't have a time bias for calibration with respect to EASI. So this is what we did with the MEDOP A, EASI, HERS. And then we used these SNO, simultaneous native overpasses, to sort out what all the other HERSs should be. What we're 
showing here then is the ratio of one hers to the following hers in terms of radiance. You want them all to be one, but some of these guys are jumping five, seven percent away from one. We know that the spectral response functions are different, so we accommodate for that. It doesn't really prove it. Only after we do the spectral shifts do we get all of these sensors, channel four, channel five, and channel seven, to line up for the whole time sequence. This is going now for some 30 years, one sensor to the next. Channel 6 isn't shown because it was good enough without anything. It seemed to not have a spectral shift problem. So we look at those simultaneous nodes. It overpasses there, the South Pole and the North Pole. And there's not, they don't agree exactly, but they're not too bad. So these are the spectral shifts we put in for all of the different sensors. No 9, 10, 11, and on, so on and so forth. The spectral shifts were as large as two or three wave numbers. So here they are listed. So that's significant enough, especially with channel 5, to affect your CO2 slicing. We looked at uh, HERS. This would be HERS, the original spectral response function, shift in respect to spectral response function with respect to calliope. And the difference here, we're a little lower than calliope. Now we're still a little lower, but it's not bad. If you want to do this loop, you can see we moved a little higher, closer perhaps to the cloud top with this recalibration. We're never going to get to the cloud top because Andy has said we see into the cloud, probably the optical depth of one. So we reprocess all of this. And this is pretty nice. You know, this is the AM orbit, pretty consistent. These are all clouds sitting at around 75 to 80 percent, no trend. High clouds, not too bad sense of sensor. Clear sky. And then for low clouds or clear sky, we're really not sure, so we have some an uncertain category. So that's the AM. Recalibration looks pretty good. We go to the PM. And now we got NOAA 15. I'm sorry, by the way. NOAA 15 was a problem before. Now it's in family. So now we go back to the PM orbit, and NOAA 11 has popped out. So we have to go back and look at that. NOAA 16 isn't too, too great either. These are the ones where you use CO2 slicing. This is the uh, cloud detection. This is where we're trying to put them in as high clouds. So comparing to Calliope for high cloud detection, we're missing maybe 5% of them. The axis here are Calliope and the diamonds are us. For all clouds, it's, uh, we're in family. So these numbers aren't bad, but as trends, you have a problem because you have an unnatural shift from one sensor to another. So, we said, well, let's do something where we don't have to do these calculations. We don't have a low cloud problem. Let's just look at uh, what we think would be very high clouds as determined by CO2 channels. If I have a brightness temperature in an opaque channel that's warmer than a less opaque channel, I'm probably looking at a very high cloud because I'm starting to see a positive lapse rate. That would be into the stratosphere. So we looked at this and compared the height difference. Every dot here is where we saw more opaque channel warmer than the less opaque channel on hers. But uh, we didn't know what we were doing for sure, so we looked at what Calliope is seeing with respect to the tropopause. We see that for 80% of these conditions right here, Calliope is within one and a half kilometers of the tropopause. So these are very high clouds, not all stratospheric. Those would be these guys here. Some of them are just below the tropopause, so they're upper tropospheric. So we have a good way of detecting these clouds just using those brightness temperatures. I don't have to do a CO2 slicing. I don't have to do a calculation of a clear radiance. I don't have to worry about a low cloud because I don't care about them. This is just two spectral channels. If I calibrate them right, I'm getting a high cloud. I'm only seeing that high cloud if it's mostly opaque. In other words, totally filling the field of view and mostly opaque. All right, so how often do you see this stuff? You see it in the tropics. These are all the clouds. These are the ones where you had that UTLS condition met. And you can see that there's a seasonal difference. This is the ITCZ. It's popping up and down from northern hemisphere to southern hemisphere. The red <coughs> is the northern hemisphere over a bunch of years. Blue is the southern hemisphere. These things have a cycle, seasonal cycle. You see them from 60 north to 60 south, maybe 0.7% of the time as high as 0.9% of the time in something like a decadal trend. 
So this is kind of exciting because it's much simpler, much cleaner. I look at NOAA 11, NOAA 14, and here I'm doing the deviation with respect to the monthly mean for that year. Now I'm going 92 to 2008. So I'm stretching this a little bit, and I, have, I see a cycle. Brent Maddox says, you ought to look at the total solar irradiance. So I look at that, and I say, wow, that's a pretty good matchup, maybe. Maybe this is stuff that really is driven by the sun. Then I go back and look at the orbit drift. I've got it drifting right through this early afternoon, which is when you would expect this deep convection. That's where it is right here. As you go beyond that, you'll see fewer. So is this total solar irradiance or orbit drift? I don't know. But it's kind of exciting. The other thing you notice is that when you have El Nino years, the ITCC, or a lot of these deep convective clouds, tend to drift eastward. So the western Pacific, you get less of them. Eastern Pacific, you get more of them. So, started looking at the trends in the Western Pacific and the Eastern Pacific in the detection of these new TLS clouds. This is what they look like. And you sort of see an anti correlation. When there's a fewer of them in the Western Pacific, they pop up in the Eastern Pacific. So, then you look at the Eastern Pacific and you look at the Nino 3.4 SST, which is also in the Eastern Pacific, and you find a very nice correlation. SST and these deep convective clouds in the East and Pacific. So we're beginning to think, think we see some connections between clouds and some of the other things that are happening. We see a lot of clouds. We think we can pin them down to where they are in the atmosphere. Um, we're probably good to about 50 hectopascals. This is the characteristics of the data set right here. And then 50 hectopascals of the cloud top pressure. Cloud amounts probably within about 15%. And I think we're seeing clouds with optimal depths that are on the order of about 0.5 or more. The strengths are that we have good detection of high thin clouds and these deep convective clouds. The weaknesses of the thermal contrast has to be there or else we do very much. We've tried to pin this down only to a top-down view of clouds. And we don't go out to large scan angles for the satellite. Um, we're trying to integrate the imager strengths and the uh, sounder strengths so that we're going to hand over the low cloud problem to the Visnier IR and IR from the imager with higher spatial resolution. And we'll hang on to our atmospheric sensitivity in the high clouds. And uh, we're trying to get away from this clear radiance estimate, but if you use the CO2 slicing, you have to figure out something that doesn't exist. What is the radiance you want to observe? That's us. This is the summary again, so the results we have from 30 years of processing this. And I'll repeat, probably when we're all done with this, our algorithm isn't as important as the recalibrated radiances that we can hand off to the next generation. Where they can use a better algorithm. But these radiances that have been recalibrated with respect to an instrument like EOS here. Now, NOAA 15 actually has existed long enough so that NOAA 15